All right, we are recording. Hey, welcome back, everyone. We have a big room today, a room full of experts. Uh, we'll go around and, and do some introductions, and I think we have a really neat uh, presentation and discussion today. So, uh, Tom, you want to take it away and introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Tom Harris. I'm a professor in economics, uh, also a state extension specialist in corporate extension and director of the University Center for Economic Development. Go ahead, Bob. All right, Fred. Uh, Fred Steinman, assistant research professor with the College of Business at the University of Nevada, Reno, and working alongside Tom at the University Center for Economic Development. All right. Thank you, Fred. And uh, Mehmet? Uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, Mehmet Tolson, uh, Professor of Economics. Uh, I'm the Director of International Business Programs in the College of Business at UNR. Uh, I'm also the uh, Barbara Smith Campbell uh, Distinguished Professor of Nevada Tax Policy. Fantastic. And uh, lastly, Roger, uh, you're our guest today, so you want to take it away? Yeah, so my name is Roger Capel. I'm a professor at the Ag and Applied Economics Department at the University of Wyoming. And, and, and like like Tom, I'm a community development specialist that work on, works on community development issues around the, around the state, obviously in Wyoming, but also in other areas and some of the surrounding states. Great. So, Tom, do you want to uh, facilitate the question? Okay. Or we just open it up? Oh, I'll, I'll start it off. This, this uh, uh, with COVID-19 and a lot of things been happening in the economies in the, in the state, uh, there's been a lot of people talking about resiliency. What does it mean? This is what we're going to address a little bit. Both Roger and I have extension appointments, and in the West, in the in the land grant systems, there is a thing. Uh, there's four regional uh, centers that kind of work on regional areas. There's one in the South, one in the Northeast, North Central, excuse me, one in the Northeast, and one in the West. And so Roger and I have been working with the Western Rural Development Center. And we developed a little thing talking about resiliency and you know the economic impact potential. What's going on with the um, COVID-19? And uh, it made me think that this might be a nice little. Uh, I think you call these podcasts or video casts. To kind of discuss this so we can get this out to the public to start talking about uh, these different areas. So we're going to be breaking it up in thirds. So I'm going to talk a little bit of what's going on in the state of Nevada uh, with the latest data. Then I'm going to turn it over to Roger to talk about resiliency and some of the things. And he's got a good example in Wyoming, which, you know, Wyoming's a resource base like us, very applicable in areas. And then we have questions from Mehmet and Fred to ask us some other things to uh, discuss in this, in this area. So I will get on uh, my screensaver and uh, get this going. Oh, do you have to give me permission, I think? okay oh, oh good okay okay i'm going to start talking a little bit this is what um, a little bit about what is resiliency and this is going to be the main focus but what i thought i'd take a little time just talking about what's been going on in the state of nevada especially uh since uh, april uh, one of the things i always like to talk about is um this little note, Peggy Newton was a speechwriter for George Bush the first, and uh, there was something she wrote I thought was very good. Was, everybody says we're in the same boat, but he says we're not in all the same boat. We're in all in the same storm. What we mean by different boats in that area is that different sized economies, different sectors are having different impacts in what's going on, and so really, it's not a it's not an equally sized boat for everybody. This storm is very much, and uh, Mark Cuban who you can guess I grew up in Texas who owns the Dallas uh, Mavericks, uh, made some interesting uh, comments one time. And he, he was talking about how the economy, the recovery could be brutal. And that I think this is something we're going to notice that all of a sudden you see an on rush, but there's some other things that we need to be addressing. Uh, Fred's with me on writing a, a project for EDA to kind of help businesses cope with coming out of COVID-19 and all the different regulations that come out. So it's going to be a different economy coming and we need to help to address this. Now the latest, I hope these things come out here, the latest is some of the labor market information we got from the Department of Employment and Training Rehabilitation and kind of shows April, you know, we went through it, March had a few numbers, but April really had the numbers kind of showed some impact from March 20 
22, uh, from March 2020 to April 22, 2020, excuse me, Nevada lost 244,800 jobs. It's a lot of jobs. If you think of the city of Boise, Boise, Idaho has a population of 229,000 people. So we've lost more than the city of, of Boise in one month. And that's quite a change that goes on there. Uh, from April 2019 to April 2020, Nevada's lost almost, a little over 250,000 jobs. So the employment impacts have been very noticeable. And uh, when people look at this, be sure to think, we'll talk about this later, maybe in another podcast, it's different of a place of work data and place of residence data. Place of work data is where people get uh, where they work. Uh, this labor market's called labor, Laos, or I want a better word, is, labor, is residence, where people reside. And they, from that, they figure out where people are unemployed because they get the number employed and, I mean, are unemployed. So uh, these are where the unemployment numbers come from. The, uh, the, the and then also the city of uh, Reno has lost about 28,000 jobs. And, and the other SMSA is Carson City, about 4,000. So uh, as you can see, there's been some pretty significant decreases going on in the state in which has gotten some of us worried. The labor market, I hope this kind of comes in, this is the labor market unemployment rates. And in 2020, April 2020, we had an estimated unemployment rate of 28.2%. Second, uh, second in this area, if we looked at the, uh, the state, uh, if it had the nation, I don't have this right at the moment, Michigan was second with 22.7%. Connecticut has the lowest unemployment rate of 7%. So you can see it's a lot of different percentage impacts. And it has to do with the nature of your economy. If you had a lot of services or uh, <coughs> employment where you're working with people face to face, here's, there's a lot of unemployment that has occurred. Now here's something I always, this, this COVID thing is so dramatic is that in the history of uh, Nevada, the highest unemployment rate is the latest one. It happened in April 2020 at 28.2%. The lowest ever, the lowest ever unemployment rate for the state of Nevada was February 2020 at 3.6%. So in two months, we've gone from the lowest to the highest. Quite a structural change. And as you see here, there's different impacts especially, you know, like Clark, Clark County has about 33.5% increase, 33.5% uh, unemployment rate in metros. And you get some places like Eureka, only 6.5. That's mainly in mining. Everything has gone up a little bit, but you can see sometimes in the rural areas, those are with the mining hasn't decreased that much because of the nature of their sectors. It's not a lot of person to person where you shut down mining and other things are kept going on. And, uh, uh, as you see here, the city of Las Vegas has about 32% unemployment rate. And it goes on that, that you can see it's been some big impacts in our, in our economy. So the other thing is Nevada gaming data. A lot of our money is from gaming. And in two, April uh, 2000, 2020, from 2019, there's been a 99.6% decrease. And so the fiscal year, Nevada gaming revenues have decreased by 11.4%. So as we know, this is going to have an impact on our economy, has an impact on our fiscal state. Uh, all of us here working at UNR, uh, Nevada System of Higher Education, as well as Roger works at Wyoming, we're noticing that the state's uh, funds are being impacted by the COVID and what has happened with the decrease in employment. And so this is what made me want to have this kind of a talk a little bit just about resiliency so people can have some idea about what it is. This is the paper that we wrote that's with the Western Rural Development Center and there's a series of COVID-19. I think there's a couple more that Roger and I are working with. Don, Don uh, Albrick is the, is, leads the, uh, the rural, Western Rural Development Center and Marion Bentley uh, also is there at Utah State in which we discuss these things. So what I'm going to do is next I'm going to have Roger. Uh, let me get off the uh, uh, podcast here, Roger, and put your system on. And let me see here. Let me get Rogers. I got Rogers here. Okay, Roger. Wait a minute. Okay. Roger, you'd like to start? Go right ahead. 
think you're on mute, Roger. There, thank you. Um, so a lot of us are looking at looking at trying to figure out how how economies start and stop, and there's been some work on that, uh, but uh, but we have to always remember that this is not just a a, a a recession, it's a pandemic generated recession. And so there are a lot of things going on that, that we have to think about. Um, uh, so if you go, let go to the next slide. You know, just sort of, you know, I'm sure you guys had the same things, you know, restaurants, food courts, cafe closures, that kind of thing, public accommodation, that kind of thing, bars, taverns, uh, microbreweries, and all that stuff. Uh, it's kind of weird in Wyoming. They have cigar bars. I don't think I've ever been to one, but but there are apparently uh, some uh, gymnasiums, movie and theaters and opera houses. And so all these things got closed. Now they're just starting to come back. And Fremont County is uh, located right in the center of the state. Um, and uh, so they asked me to to uh, to uh, talk about uh, uh, kickstarting the economy. And uh, um, and so I, I was thinking about how this uh, this this works. Uh, there's been some work on the recovery from the uh, uh, what, what we used to call anyway the the, the Great Recession, uh, and uh, so uh, that helps get, give us some kind of insight. But but it's not a perfect match, so we have to be careful about that. So, um, uh, but but how do how do econ economies recover? Uh, rural economies uh, and uh, how do they uh, um, uh, and, and how do you manage that recovery? And, and resilience is all about managing a recovery. Um, uh, so I started looking at this, and one of the, and, and we start with, um, there's a paper by Ron Martin, a British economist, uh, that I get, got a lot about, uh, of this stuff from. Um, and uh, so he, he brought out the plucking model. Now, Milton Friedman started this in '93. Is you have a long-term growth rate, there's a recession, and, it, and then it, and as you go along uh, the time, then it comes back to that to that long-term growth rate. Now, Friedman was talking mostly about a uh, um, a uh, uh, about a, a national economy where there's a lot of depth. Uh, uh, so if, 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 if an economy comes in and, and or a, an industry or a recession comes in and an industry negatively affects, affects a certain subset of, of, of uh, uh, it was affected by a certain subset, by, by, a, by, a, by a recession, then um, um, uh, other, other parts of the recession might not be, be or sorry, other parts of the economy might not be uh, um, uh, as, as affected by that. And in the last recovery or recession we had, for Wyoming, that was the case. We had, you know, massive drops in the energy economy, which is the prime economic base. But um, the national parks were open, so we got 4.1 million people that go to uh, Yellowstone National Park and 3.3 million that go to uh, 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 Grand Teton, for example. Well, you, we have 538,000 people in the state, and and that's um, uh, that's a lot of people coming in, regardless of the recession. So, um, so it is a, it is a, a an important issue. Um, uh, what Martin was talking about, though, was that it doesn't necessarily fit the plucking model. Doesn't necessarily fit fit what goes on in rural in states and, and rural and rural economies. Um, uh, in fact, I heard this. Um, on multiple cases at multiple times, and I think you probably have heard it, that you know we're waiting for the economy to snap back, okay? And so that that um, that plucking model is what is what's snapping back. It's like plucking a a, a rubber band or a guitar string or something, right? Um, but uh, um, what Martin argues is that there, is that there may be different ways of of, of responding, okay? So. Um, one possibility is that number A there, okay, where you return to a long run growth rate, but at a lower level because there's permanent changes in the economy. So let's say, for example, in our, in our state, in Wyoming, um, even if the economy comes back and we figure out how to manage COVID-19, okay, um, we still have, have the, uh, dec the long-term decline of some of our energy components of our energy industry. That doesn't go away, it's still there. And so we're still down, uh, still uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, being impacted by that at a lower rate, we may be growing at the same rate, but we might, uh, but we might, but at a lower rate, a lower level. Um, another possibility, though, and this is what everybody's worried about, is long run decline. Okay, and so if you lose enough of, a, of, of an economy in terms of oh, the public goods that are generated, the public services like uh, the, uh, um, the schools, the, the post office, even. Uh, those kinds of things, you know, or let's say a permanent permanent shutdown of, of a major of several major industries, there could be long long run declines. And the West has seen that in, in, in areas all over the uh, uh, all, well, all over the United States, but especially in the West. As a matter of fact, there is a uh, uh, a uh, little town called uh, Jeffrey City that uh, uh, was a booming place during the uranium. Uh, 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 boom in the 1970s, and uh, now it's actually bought out by a, another company, a real estate company, because no, uh, there is no more uranium from the area. Though that could change, but not, but, but not likely. So, um, so, uh, and they lost their their school, and so when you lose a school, you know, you 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 tend to be. Uh, uh, that's when things really start to start declining. So, uh, what? Martin was arguing is that is that from from a resilience perspective, that recovery has to be has to look at look at um, at, a, at at a lot of issues that might be occurring at a small area, at a small region, so county level, at at uh, uh, the state level, even. Um, so, um, uh, for example, some of the work that we that we put in our in our in our uh, paper. Um, uh, one of them looked at one one set of authors looked at um, um, out of Idaho looked at um, measure resilience by okay you look at the peak and then here's the recession and how long did it take you back get back to the recession and so that difference is, is how you uh, how you actually um, uh, measure resilience um, and what he found out was that uh, if you have a small population and heavily ag dependent you tend to snap back quicker than if you have a manufacturing. Um, another uh, uh, study by uh, uh, Hahn and Getz out of um, uh, Penn State University uh, looked at the nation and the regions and argued that their resilience in terms of how you actually get get back to your to your uh, before the uh, uh, recession started uh, was. Uh, it took about um, anywhere from 14 to, uh, what did it say, after six months or 14 months, you, you may have gotten three to three and a half percent nationally on terms of, uh, of the employment that you lost, okay? So that, though, in, 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 in most rural areas or across the country. Uh, urban areas, both, uh, both sets of papers actually looked at that, so they tended to snap back relatively quickly. So, um, uh, the, um, uh, the next uh, slide, Tom. So here's here's you know uh, um, uh, again Fremont County. So if you look at that in 2001, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, a uh, a growth, a slow growth, but a growth because of the, of the economic boom or the oil and gas boom that was occurring there. And then by 2009, uh, gas went down, down to down, down, and then kind of picked up again again because of tourism and then and then it's been declining ever since because because of the um, um, different things so so this is pre uh, um, uh, COVID-19 but the expectation is that if they don't do anything okay that it will continue to decline even if we do uh, dig ourselves out of uh, the coronavirus the pandemic and so that's a problem you look at the next slide okay you know, uh, on one hand, we'd like to see see the green line, okay, uh, but but in reality, uh, uh, that was driven a lot by what the assumptions within the boom itself, and so we have we're, what we have is 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 the blue the blue line, the declining line in in the county, and so they're they're really concerned about what's going to drive drive that their uh, their economy. They like a lot of those stay those counties in that in that rural area are uh, are also dependent upon uh, tourism to Grand Teton and, and Yellowstone National Park and those they have been closed but supposedly they're they're going to open up 
but they're also dependent upon, upon oil. If you go to the next one. Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, uh, this is the futures West Texas Intermediate, which is pretty valuable oil normally. And it actually was the first time in history we've seen actually futures prices that are minus uh, 40 and $50 a barrel. Uh, uh, we still have in Wyoming um, minus 58 for some of the heavy oils, right? And so what we're looking at there is, is a collapse of a traditional economic base. And so we can't, that's not going to snap back. We, we just don't think that's what that's going to happen. And so that poses problems not only for the counties in terms of their public finance, but also for the, for the state itself. Next. Um, now, what, what, thankfully, what Martin did do is to talk about um, um, what it takes to, uh, uh, to, to avoid some of those. And, uh, and I call it, uh, he didn't call it this, there was sort of a rural reformation trend reformation trend, you know, where, okay, yeah, yeah, you know, we, we, uh, uh, we, we might go back to the long-term uh, average growth, or we might actually go, go higher than that, you know, how do you do that? So that you have the disaster or national crisis and drops it, but then it, then it tends to grow, grow, grow back quicker, and it gives the opportunity, gives the, the local economy the opportunity to, uh, uh, to think about other other issues. Now, you know, we've always always heard this. You know, never waste a uh, a, a crisis or, or a recession. I, uh, Tom and I have talked about this, but uh, you know, I my concern is that is that we probably we, in Wyoming anyway. We we may we may not waste a recession, but we uh, uh, we probably waste our boom and uh, not thinking about how to diversify back that that way so so now is the time to start thinking about how to sort of rebuild that economy uh in terms of um um uh for for new things if, if the economy comes back in the case of nevada i don't have, doubt for a second that, that eventually uh the casinos are going to open up and they're going to have probably more tourists than you, than, than you like you know uh, and same thing with the national parks uh next uh, slide Oop. There we go. Okay, uh, let's go. Go. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So, you know, essentially, is, is we have to think in terms of transitioning from one set of economic basis to another. And this is what I was trying to tell the people in uh, in Fremont County. You know, releverage resources. You know, you know. Okay, you got water. Is there a way to sort of to leverage that to to build new new types of industries there? Uh, and um, I don't think they were particularly enthused about this idea, but, but I just threw out ideas that said, okay, well, what about this? What are, here's what we have, you know. Um, uh, another one that's come up uh, multiple times for us, again, this is not, 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 uh, not Nevada, is, is a reclamation industry cluster. You know, if, if the coal mines are going to start slowing down and, 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 uh, going, and coal companies are going bankrupt, then somebody's going to have to clean those places up. And so some economic developers and I have been talking about this over the years, okay? Um, uh, an example of that is the Hanford Nuclear Re Reservation in Washington. Um, and uh, 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 they turn, uh, now they have a lot of problems still, so don't, don't, uh, don't, uh, uh, don't assume that, that they're out of the woods, but, but they're uh, international companies now in that Hanford area that have figured out how to clean up uh, nuclear nuclear contamination that nobody's figured, nobody's has in the past and are selling selling their services worldwide. So you know, so trying to figure out these kinds of issues is 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 about leveraging resources. Um, so uh, uh, next next slide. Uh, finally, you know, you know. What you've got to do, I think, and what we're trying to get, get communities to do here is, is you know, building resources for pivoting to new economic basis, you know, and entrepreneurship, enga entrepreneur engagement. There, there are ideas out there, you know, and, and uh, you have to sort of, you have to sort of, you know, co coax the uh, uh, ent potential entrepreneurs to actually talk about them, but they are there. Workshops and communication strategies, business retention expansion programs, you know, uh, in our case, we've got the economic development and the state economic development. 
which is the Business Council and University Extension and others. And so uh, the Western World Development Center has a lot of to uh, our community things and I think that's what what I wanted to end with was was that you know uh, it's time it is time you know never again never never waste or uh, waste a good good uh, recession or, or disaster but on the other hand uh, uh, everything is cyclical and, and figuring out ways during during good times to protect the bad during the bad times is something we're going to have to do uh, in the in the um, pandemic or the, the uh, epidemic side of things. This is what the fourth e e pan uh, epidemic we've had in 20 years. Was. We're probably going to have more, you know. So um, uh, it, may, it may not hit us, it may, uh, may hit us and not you guys, but nonetheless, you know, that, that, that's where, where we're at. So, so uh, uh, we, have our, we all have our work cut out for us. That's, uh, I think that's it. That's some very uh, interesting information. Any questions? I think I think what we're going to do is start off. Matt, I uh, I don't think I need to bring your questions up. If you just ask them, uh, Matt has some questions, sure. and uh, I think this gets started for both Roger and myself. Go right ahead. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thank evening. you. Yeah, thank you, Tom and Roger, for uh, uh, your presentations. This is very interesting topic, uh, of course. And, uh, and and Tom and I have been started. Uh, they, they've been talking about this. A little bit, we started sort of uh, pondering about this, uh, you know, question uh, about resilience reg uh, regarding Nevada. So I, I thought that maybe uh, I'll ask like, you know, one question to Roger and one question to uh, Tom. And I actually want to start with uh, Roger. Um, so uh, Roger, in your presentation, I think you already addressed uh, my, my first question about like, you know, okay, so what what is resilience? Like, what do we uh, you know, call this thing called uh, resilience, but uh, but maybe a related question that um, uh, that would be good is uh, rural versus urban resilience. So uh, we will think that the COVID nineteen will be impacting, of course, like everybody in all areas, right? So no doubt. But uh, you know, would the rural areas be impacted? Uh, you know, very different from the urban areas. I guess that's uh, one question, and maybe related to that. Uh, you know, can we say uh, something about maybe based on the, the previous recession, the Great Recession in 2008-2009, you know, whether we can say like, you know, here's a success story uh, about a rural area, let's say within a state that uh, like, let's say did much better in terms of resilience compared to an urban area in the same state or like, you know, close, uh, close by. So, uh, so that's one. And my question to Tom is, uh, I was thinking about north-south uh, differences, right, in Nevada. Uh, and, and you actually pointed out, uh, you know, very nicely that uh, the unemployment rate, if you look at these indicators such as the, uh, the recent unemployment uh, numbers, uh, there's a big difference, right? So mm -hmm. it, it is safe to say that the economy we see in the north is, uh, you know, a little different from the south. So given that, um, you know, can you say something about um, moving forward, like in the future, whether the resilience will be better or stronger in the north versus south? So what do you think? So, okay. you know, those are my uh, two okay. big questions uh, to start with. Roger, go ahead. Okay, um, sure. So uh, Ring, Ringwood and uh, Watson and Lewin, uh, did, a, did a study. Now, a lot of this depends on how you measure resilience, too, and I'll talk about that here in a second. But, but um, um, and what they found was that, that the small rural counties that are heavily ag dependent um, uh, actually had a higher measurable resilience than manufacturing counties. Now, um, that said, uh, and, then, and then I think uh, uh, Han and, and Stefan Getz's work. Uh, it was a little broader than that, but but uh, uh, but did a different way of measuring 
recovery rates uh, at times uh, as opposed to uh, a, resi a formal resilience model. But uh, in their case, both of them argued that, that, uh, that uh, the, res the recovery of urban areas is quicker uh, and higher than recovery in those rural areas. Um, and, uh, yet, and yet the resilience is itself, wasn't I measured again? Um, is uh, um, is higher in those in those those small ag ag uh, agricultural dependent uh, communities. And the reason why I, I I'm hesitant about this is it's something that Tom and I and Marianne and Don have been talking about a little bit. Is that and there's no research on this yet? Is that um, maybe the question isn't resilience, but uh, how uh, the, the more resilience. The, uh, but how much resilience do you want? Because there could be a uh, trade-off between resilience and opportunity. Um, I remember this when I was working extension in Idaho years ago. Uh, uh, we, were, we were in this county, Idaho County. It's, one of, it's the largest county in, in the state, and it's all rural. It's a very rural county. And the county commissioner came up to, to uh, the group of us that were talking and giving presentations, and she said, you know, I understand why my kids just got jobs in Spokane, Washington, which is about uh, four or three, four hours away. Um, and I understand why um, um, that's the case. And that's where, the, that's where the opportunities are. But what I'd like to have seen is how do you create opportunities for them to stay in Idaho County? And it's always stuck with me ever since. And, and it occurred to me that, that what, what, uh, Ringwood, uh, uh, Watson, and Lewin are looking at doing is is is, the, uh, is is whether or not you know you know is whether or not they've got too much resilience. Uh, what they showed was that and I think Hannon gets to the same thing was that those urban area metro areas are not really real relative to some of these urban areas are not real resilient, but their, their, their recovery rates are quicker and they're just simply more, there's more activity, which one, one would expect, I think. So, so it's something that we need to think about more is, is that what is, how much resilience do we want? And is there, okay, that's an open question. Is there an opportunity and resilience trade-off? So, but in general, uh, those urban areas snap back to use uh, the Milton Friedman term uh, quicker and maybe not quite to where where the uh, uh, the economy was or maybe sometimes even higher depending on the, on the area than rural areas but but for the most part the resilience levels as measured tend to be uh, uh, higher in, in these small small uh, rural economies uh, yeah uh, good point I, I add a little bit to what uh, uh, Roger was saying, uh, basically, you know, the north south was very interesting. I always think uh, it's very interesting in the state of Nevada, our linkages, and this is something Fred has always pointed out to me, is that it's an east west uh, linkage with economics where Reno is linked to San Francisco, Las, Las Vegas is linked to Southern California. We're linked north south by fiscal F I S C A L because of the gaming revenues, but it's kind of interesting how we're linked and how it gives a difference. Uh, it was interesting, I think you have to look at the economic base and what's impacted. In the last Great Recession, it was really a financial impact. And if you went to City of Reno, I always remember I talked to this person that owned some apartments. He had a lot of vacancies in apartments. But then in Elko, which was gold mining, which was going strong, he had people waiting in lines. And so it's sometimes it's what are the sectors are impacted. Now, in this COVID, what we have is this almost kind of like Bob Potts sometimes calls it administrative closure. What we have is we close a lot of businesses if they had face-to-face -face contact. And of course, casinos have that. And that, and, and Nevada, Nevada was famous because in the early times, we were the only, we were the monopoly. In 1980s, everything opened up and so different things occurred. And of course, we got uh, here in the North got impacted more than Vegas in that Vegas is an international market. When the casinos opened up in California, it, it, it took some of our uh, uh, way. So in a way, the North became less resilient than the South. And I always thought that one of the things is that uh, because of that, and we were in, in the dire straits, 
we did have that Tahoe Reno industrial complex. We were more a bit, a more to take a chance, so we brought in Tesla and these other things. And so we, we brought in these other high-tech industries and diversified our economy. And I also think that, that we're going to find it in some of our areas, even our rural areas, that, uh, you know, the electric cars and mainly batteries. I always think the batteries, to me, is the, is the big thing because everybody's looking at moving to green energy. Well, the only thing bad about green energy is that with solar, you got nighttime. And with wind, you got calm winds versus bad winds. And with uh, hydropower, you got drought. So what do you do when something happens? Well, you better have a battery. And so uh, these batteries are going to be something that's going to be, uh, I think, a very essential to this new power. Plus, in Humboldt County, we're developing a, a mine that has potential of getting lithium. So we could have a, a linkage of far and backward a cluster there, a whole new industry uh, has started to develop here. The South uh, had tried to do that. I, mean, I know with uh, uh, one of the electric car generator and didn't make it, but you know Vegas is still growing. I mean, sometimes uh, we look at Vegas as kind of shown to me by some uh, somebody in Clark County. Uh, they grow about thirty thousand a year, which is about the city of Carson City, the size of Carson City every year. So uh, the casinos are impacted but the things are opening the problem is to me is how the business model has changed and uh the in the casino industry uh, is it, uh how many people can come in what kind of costs are coming in there uh the north i think is because of uh our, our we less less we became less resilient on with gaming we were we've been expanding going in different directions uh, Vegas has still, and they're expanding a little bit more now. I think this may encourage them uh, to bring in new, new industries also. So that's what's been going on, the difference in the north and the south. And with all this resiliency stuff, I think it's based on, you do the location quotients and shift share, what kind of base do you have? And is that base impacted? Uh, I look at Connecticut only has 7.9% unemployment. Well, they're mainly finance. Uh, finance of computers, people aren't being impacted. Here, we got impacted a whole lot because of, of um, service, the service sector really took a, a cut with this uh, COVID-19. So that's why I say the difference. Anything else, Mehmet or, or Fred, whatever? <coughs> well, you know, I, I have a couple other questions, but uh, uh, do, do you want me to ask uh, now as well or? Is that Fred? Fred, you got a couple questions or something? Maybe, uh, maybe Fred first. You know, maybe to a certain degree, you know, your sense of, you know, how do we encourage resiliency and recovery in, in economic downturns like this, especially one led by a pandemic, um, you know, across the way, you know, what do you feel is the, the relationship between a local government's ability to provide critical infrastructure, you know, more community development oriented assets and the ability of that local base economy in a rural community to, to recover. Uh, while you think of that question, you know, to give you a little context in Nevada, if you look at property tax receipts for every single mm -hmm. local government in the state of Nevada, every municipality, every county, every school district, regardless of whether or not they're in a metro area or a non-metro area, they never recovered to pre-Great Recession levels. So every single county, every single school district, every single city in the state of Nevada had, in the last fiscal year took in less property tax receipts than they took in the fiscal year prior to the Great Recession. You know, so if, if local governments haven't even gotten back to, you know, a fiscal par from the Great Recession, what can local governments do to provide the critical infrastructure necessary to support recovery and growth moving forward? Wow, uh, you want to answer that? I got some, well, let me do that real quick and let Roger come in. You know, Fred, that's something we've discussed. Uh, what happens, sometimes policies are made and people think what's going on in an economy will continue forever, I found that. 
th there was a, a limit on a 3% increase in, pro in values uh, that was on property tax. That was put on when everybody's property before the Great Recession, you remember properties were going up, 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 up. Of course, people were paying. And that, as a response to that, the legislature put in this 3% growth. And when it bottomed, it fell. They didn't put a bottom 3%. When it bottomed, it bottomed. And now they're going back up, but they only can go up 3%. Population doesn't do that. Uh, the economy expanded doesn't do that. And so what happens, you really have limited the ability of government to adequately fund, uh, you know, government, uh, it's got a, government is a, is a, uh, is a fellow at Jordan named Dave Craybill who did a, did a study and, he, and with his model, he included the efficiencies you get with federal or government spending vis-a-vis -vis. out here, we got I-80. With I-80, retailers do not have to have large inventories. In fact, we invented an industry called just-in-time inventory because of that, and I'm one of the biggest industries ever called Walmart because of that. And so government has a very big, they add efficiency. Now, yes, you got to watch out. I mean, they too much goose, goose up the pudding, but we uh, it will very much get into that. And this is something we've always talked about, the infrastructure. I think people are talking about how we need to de develop infrastructure education of people uh, 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 in Ely. I know Fred's been in Ely a lot like I have and one of the most enlightening things I ever had was from the Ely mayor who asked me uh, talking about uh, 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 broadband and, I said, and very limited and she said yes we can't uh, all we can't keep young people in here because they can't game. Well I was thinking about the hotel in Nevada you play 21 and she goes no no Tom they can't download their Netflix gaming, uh, broadband has become a, a quality of life. I mean, I'm too old to understand that. You need that for people to come in to do business and for people to stay there. So uh, there's very much government infrastructure that aids and just look at interstates, what they have done. Interstates have changed the economy and, and all that. And I do believe that would add to the, ver because if you want to diversify into something that required broadband, forget it. You got to have, we you know you would talk about people. We need labor. We also need infrastructure like highways and internet and other things to come in there. Good water and all that sewers and all that for for uh, economic development. If you have that, then you can proceed. But I don't know. That's my take on it. Roger, you got anything you'd like to add? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I think identifying and leveraging those are, are, are in a sense inventorying those resources those public infrastructure resources do have what are, where are they uh, uh, wanting where are they where are they not is, is the first step you have to uh, you know m most economies have those kinds of issues those kinds of things it's just trying to figure out if there's a way to leverage it to, to a new uh, a new use I, in, in the process of working with a with a, a group of people, I got a grad student working on on creating activated carbon out of coal. Right, it's called coal char. Um, it's actually cheaper than biochar, and uh, um, and uh, it can be used if it's if it's high or fine for for micro uh, 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 microelectronics, or it can be used actually for uh, uh, to enhance uh, agricultural operations. Uh, because of the, the properties of the stuff, that, you know, at, at a lower level of, of development. Now, will that change the, or save the coal industry? Well, who knows? Probably not. But but the uh, point is that they're thinking about that kind of stuff, and I think it's important to to try to try to do that. Uh, but you know, you, you bring up a good point in in the sense that of the public finance limitations, because this is a discussion that I actually had with. Uh, in Fremont County, it was because of the, the uh, county commissioners the, and the um, uh, the mayors and city council were in there, and and, and so they were saying, well, yeah, but our our, uh, um, our uh, these these longtime businesses could could uh, um, could close down permanently, um, and uh, they um, and they're they're an important part of the tax base, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so I actually had a conversation with the chief of staff of the uh, of our governor. I mean, one nice thing about living in a state with a small population is that uh, you know the, you get to you, you actually run into these people. You have to be careful. You don't you know say uh, talk bad about them, I guess. But but uh, 
Um, the uh, and and these are good guys. I mean, you know, it's, I shouldn't say I shouldn't I shouldn't, uh, shouldn't apply anything like that. But but uh, you know, and they're actually thinking of okay, is there a way to let counties and communities borrow in the short run uh, 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 out of their our permanent mineral trust fund, for example? I last I heard that idea never went anywhere. But but one of the things that that uh, that era, that you know, sitting in small communities like this, that if Congress, I think, uh, Tom, you were saying this, right? That if, to, if this, this uh, uh, Congress doesn't pass legislation to protect those public services that communities uh, require, then economic development probably won't happen. And so uh, economic develop, development at the local level needs to consider those resources and then, and then if, if the state can't do it, hopefully the feds will come in. But but the, the you have to have those public public um, um, uh, services. Otherwise, people are not going to go there. So it is it is a real risk. Right. I remember uh, some words of wisdom from my very first boss um, in the public sector when I worked for the city of Reno's redevelopment agency. The ability to write a check is everything, you know. And we can we can pray and you know, come up with great economic development strategies and recovery plans and resiliency plans. But ultimately, if you can't fund it, you know, none of it will become real. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and like Roger's saying, we may have to pivot, figure out new ways to finance everything. We do have a unique thing in the West. We have a lot of public lands, which imp impact the finances and all that. So, but anyway. But, uh, Although I think, you know, and, and, and again, maybe something for you to think about, I think that the, the Western states in particular, you know, states like Wyoming and Nevada, you know, maybe New Mexico and Utah with relatively small populations compared to their Eastern counterparts or coastal yeah. counterparts, you know, the fiscal systems in the West are, I think, particularly vulnerable, you yeah, know, right. this type of pandemic and, and economic collapse. I mean, if you look at the, the budget for the state of Nevada for fiscal year 2020, 2020, 2021, say that five times fast, uh, state, and sa state sales and use tax accounts for 30% of all anticipated revenues collected by the state. Well, you, you've just put in a policy that says every retailer with face-to-face -face contact has to reduce capacity by 50%. You're talking about a potential up to 50% reduction oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. in 30% of the state's budget. And number two on that list is gaming percentage fees, which accounts for 18% of the state's <laughs> general fund revenue. And guess what's been closed for the last three months? Every single gaming establishment in the state of Nevada. Um, you know, so I think, it, and again, maybe for, for you to comment on is, you know, in, in Nevada, Wyoming, and other states where the tax base is so limited because the economic base is so limited, if you have a economic calamity like COVID-19 that specifically targets those elements of the fiscal system, the road to recovery is not a year away. It's not five years away. It may not even be a decade away. You may never get back to Thank par you. because of the lost capacity, you, you know, from one year to the next and the failure to be able to generate enough revenues to actually invest in things that'll stimulate economic growth. Uh, good point for what uh, Roger and Mehmet are. I, are I also, I'm part of a WRDC. We're do, looking at the COVID impacts on fiscal, and you usually have a three-legged stool, stool, stool: income tax, sales tax, and property tax. In the West, everybody has two legs, and that's why we're flipping around. If you go, and uh, uh, I think Mehmet has some new data. I think we did a podcast on that too, to showing yeah. that. If you go to New Mexico, yeah, we, if you go to New Mexico, they're all in petroleum. Guess what? 67, what's happening? You go to Alaska, petroleum. And uh, if you go to Wyoming, you got coal. And you got here, we got gaming. And so uh, we're very, we're not diversified in our, in our revenues. I don't know, Matt, you, you might. Yeah, that. so and we, we did a, a complete separate uh, podcast last time. Uh, and actually, I'll say that our reliance on uh, sales and uh, related uh, excise type taxes is even more than what the uh, general revenue fund shows, like that 30%. It is uh, with the census data, as I as you will remember, that you actually go over 50% if you're talking about just the state tax revenues. But the issue is even, uh, I think, um, bigger than that, which is the 
the fact that, uh, and, and, I, and I pointed out like in the previous podcast too, right? Uh, federal government can do deficit spending, state and local governments can't, yeah. right? So that's it. So, uh, and, and at the same time, you know, over the, um, uh, the years, um, you know, federal government delegated more and more really important uh, public services to state and local governments, including public safety, public health, well, and public health, you know, come on, if you're talking about a, a crisis uh, coming from a virus spreading, and uh, you're talking about public health being uh, one of the major responsibilities of state governments, and to some extent local, uh, and, you know, where's the revenue to match that? And uh, I will say, uh, you know, I don't want to uh, sound like even uh, more gloomy, but uh, let's not forget that in the background, uh, you have, um, you know, still more than 27 million people without health insurance. You have a, a really big trend of automation that is happening that, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the people, the scientists and the engineers and the economists all saying that it will continue and it will, you know, get more intense, uh, which will probably have impact on the labor markets, including the local labor markets. And um, the demography in the rural areas is uh, you know, very different from the demography in the urban areas. So uh, I've studied uh, aging of the population in um, you know, like, uh, counties in the US. Uh, so you have a, a big issue with the rural aging. And of course, uh, with the COVID-19, that is impacting uh, people in nursing homes, retirement communities, especially badly, right? So, and, and you have a lot of these rural retirement communities out there in the nation. Uh, and, you know, like that's, that's an added, uh, you know, concern and issue uh, moving forward. So we have uh, even like, you know, other than, and of course, climate change, uh, which, you know, seems to be doing a little better maybe because of the uh, lack of activity these days, but, you know, we, we had it in the background. So all these things mixed, uh, I think the, uh, the imbalance that I see, uh, you know, with the, um, uh, you know, with the rural versus urban is, uh, or like a bit local level you know, government finances and economy is that uh, in, in many ways, state and local areas uh, you know, are seeing that their hands are tied. They're asked to do a lot, but their hands are tied. We have these big stimulus programs, economic and fiscal, uh, you know, but um, you know, what is the uh, exact uh, you know, support that is going to state and local governments from the federal level? So federal level is the place where you can do the deficit uh, uh, financing and, and deficit spending. Uh, so they are the ones that will be able to do that stimulus, but you know, what is the uh, support? So I see that as the major weakness that uh, is especially going to be impacting the rural areas moving forward. Uh, well, I, I don't know, Bob, we've gone almost about an hour, haven't we? <laughs> and, uh, I think we may, I know you got some more questions, but I think we might just call it here for a little bit and we may do another one of these because we're bringing up good questions right and left. Uh, maybe after seeing, uh, after a, a month or two of opening up with phase two here and uh, also summer vacation in Wyoming, we can see how our rural economies are doing in Wyoming and Nevada. And, uh, you know, with this, see if we're resilient or if there's anything else coming out uh, with this. So, uh, Bob, I'll turn it back to you. I, I want to thank Roger, you from Wyoming, and Fred and Mehmet to be part of this. It's very, some, very it's interesting times, to say the least. least sorry. Yeah, that, that was fantastic. Uh, thank you all. Um, any final quick thoughts before we hang up for the day? All right. Thank you very much. We'll get this online and get it out, hopefully, in the next few days or early next week. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yes, it was a pleasure to meet me and to see you guys. Yeah.